Hi, I'm Susan. I'm from Well Peaceful, and I'm just going to read you a couple of poems. One's on empathy, and the other's on resolving differences. First one's called Empathy, and the reason I've called it Empathy, with some dashes in between, is because M is like an emotional empath. Empath is to feel others. You're a psychopath or your sociopath are disconnected. The empath is the opposite. So I just feel to say that in cases where narcissism is occurring and what have you, they often are attracted to the empaths because the empath has something that they are wanting but don't feel. It's very complicated how situations unfold. Anyway, this poem is to reflect empathy. To feel empathy for another is to stand in her shoes, to not compare but be fair, to help her find her feet, for she may have fallen. And it need not be an injury, just embarrassment when quick. But if she's really hurting, it is then when she needs a real friend. For to stand alone leaves one in despair. Misunderstandings need to be repaired. For if you were to walk in her shoes, you would understand where she has come from. You see, the territory has been unforgiving, stuck between a rock and a hard place. For to be soft was never seen as strong. Perhaps then you may not be so sure she's wrong. For you can feel her genuine compassion. You will cry with her at night. You may hold her tight as she is seeking comfort. For she is trying to do what is right and good and kind. In a world that walks the other way. In silence. So empathy. Without empathy, this is why the world takes the shape of unfeeling and uncaring it's because people are not being taught or they're not being modeled empathy and that is to witness people actually caring for other people what we see is an impassive face that's very common now particularly in cities in country towns less so so people put on the, the pretense of unfeeling I'll actually tell you about a dream I had which was quite interesting it was when I was in London many years ago back in the early 90s and in the dream, I remember I was walking through um, what was like a, a station, like a railway station, or it could have been an airport, but it was a place of transit, people moving to get, get um, onto transport. And I remember seeing orange jackets, which were very similar to the British rail jackets at the time, sort of like vests. And I remember walking into the station there was turnstiles and I saw someone on the floor who had there was blood around them and I remember looking up at the eyes of the people and I saw all these emotions they were very upset at seeing the guy on the floor there was another aspect of the dream where I felt myself kind of like walking down almost like an aisle like it was like a shopping or a supermarket aisle and I saw this guy with a white shirt, I'll never forget him, very stocky, strong body, but short but stocky. He had uh, black curly hair. And I was, I, it's really funny the things you remember. I just remember salt and pepper shakers up on, you know, on the shelving. And I looked at him and then I woke up. So I, I don't know what that meant, but a week later, I was in Farringdon Station in London and I remember coming through the turnstiles and I saw a guy on the ground. He was blood, blood everywhere. <laughs> He'd been stabbed. I'm not laughing because I'm thinking it's good. I'm laughing because I tend to do that when I'm shocked. <laughs> I laugh. He was on the ground and I remember looking at the faces and they were impassive. It was like the dream saw the heart of the people was what actually happened. That was powerful. That was a prophetic dream that I had. 
But the thought there is we look around our world and we, we think people don't care. I believe what the dream showed me was that they actually do, but they cover it. And certainly in Britain, they cover it more than here in Australia. So that feeling of there's no empathy can easily be generated. People don't care about each other. And we see people on the street, you know, there are people that stop and do something, but for the most part, people walk past and I've certainly been amongst them. I remember sitting behind a guy who was giving out the big issue in London before it came here to Australia. And I sat and watched him having coffee, you know, just observing. And what I was interested in was how many people stopped and bought the big issue, which is a magazine that's for homeless people. The, the proceeds of the magazine actually go to the homeless person who's selling it. Great articles in there. It's very good journalism. So I was sort of watching, but the most, uh, most part of what I observed was people walking past, not actually doing anything. And another time I remember, I have a friend who lived in um, Maida Vale in London. Oh, no, it wasn't Maida Vale. It was um, Penge, South East Penge. So it's southern part of London. And I remember her and I went out and we went to the London Underground, which is the Underground Railway. And she just, you know, virtually stepped over people who are homeless. And I just remember recoiling and going, I'm never going to be like that. I'm never going to step over people <laughs> and say it's all good. <laughs> you know, as if they're like the furniture. They're just the furniture. We just step over them. They're actually a human being lying in a sleeping bag on the pavement. <laughs> and we just get used to them as part of our environment, like it's a tree or a bench. So I remember that moment very distinctly. I thought, no, I'm never going to get used to it. And I'd even leave the city rather than get used to it. I'm not going to desensitise is the point. No way. I'm going to feel my humanity. I'm going to feel the people that are around me. I'm going to care about them. You know, it doesn't mean that I believe I can take away all their pain. I can't. We all have our pain and that's the way it goes. But it doesn't mean I just detach and go, oh, well, probably a drug addict. <laughs> no. You don't know their story. I sat with another guy uh, in Ireland, it was in Dublin, and I wasn't dressed as a clown. I had actually clowned and met with a homeless guy. I might actually start with that one. I was clowning around, juggling. This is in Dublin with an older gentleman who was a Quaker, and the Quakers are known for their peace work. They're, they're sort of a Christian group, but they're more akin to the kind of an intellectual sect, if you like, of Christianity, and they tend to be very engaged in, you know, public works and, you know, helping the people. They're very anti-war as well. So this old guy, he was part of the Quakers, and I took him out uh, for a bit of a spin around Dublin, <laughs> and I saw this guy. He was, he was riding on the pavement. They write in chalk, and I just, you know, had a chat with him as a clown. It was really nice, and Gave him love, you know, talked to him like I would anyone. And he was writing a message on the pavement. It was kind of philosophical, actually. I can't remember exactly what it, he said now, but I remember it, it caught my attention and I thought that's really interesting. And I know in some of the writings that I've seen by homeless people, they've talked about their experience. And I think that's really important because people are judging them and they don't understand what has happened to put them in that position. So I've always felt a lot of empathy. Um, the other case I'll tell you about is a gentleman I sort of stopped and talked to who was on the street in Dublin. And I wasn't dressed as a clown this time, I was just myself. And he had six children. And he said that he had the financial crisis, because I was there in 2000 and, uh, 2010, 2008, the financial crisis hit. He was a he was actually, um, if you like, an outcome of that. He had a business and his business went south. It collapsed, and he ended up on the street. And his six children never never sought him out, never helped him. It was actually very sad. He had survived six years on the street. This is an elderly. I would say he was around probably about 50 at my age abandoned on the street but I said to him you know you are a success you've survived for all, 
all these years on the street. I don't see you as a failure at all. I think most people would be terrified to be where you are. And I said, can I write your story? And uh, I gave him my email and I just said, if you'd like me to write your story, I'm more than happy to do it. He didn't come back to me, unfortunately, but I do believe the stories need to be heard. So that's what empathy does. Empathy moved me to actually connect. And I've done it with many others as well and given them a hug and, you know, they're just like you or me. But yet we treat them, you know, like, a, oh, well, you made your own bed, go lie in it. <laughs> well, no, they, we don't have full employment, actually, <laughs> economically speaking. <laughs> you don't know. They, I mean, I, I just very briefly, an interlude, I just had a memory I remember meeting a professor who was actually homeless in Sydney. This was years ago when I was younger. He became an alcoholic and lost everything. He went on the street. So people are not what they seem. You know, you think, oh, bomb. There's a really good song I used to play on radio too. Um, wear your under, it's called You Wear Your Underpants on the, out, on the Outside of Your Pants. Under, underwear on the Outside of Your Pants. Check it out on the net. It's a good song. I used to play it. And in the song, some guy sees, you know, someone on the street goes, get a job, you bum, <laughs> you know. And in the song he's saying, I somehow don't think his CV is up to date and the fact that he's wearing his underwear outside his pants isn't going to really put him in a good position to win that <laughs> in the interview. <laughs> you know, somehow the guy who's interviewing him is going to look at that and think there might be a problem here. So when people throw away terms like, go get a job, you bum, <laughs> clearly they've never been homeless or had a major crisis where they've lost everything. Could have even been a heartbreak. You might have lost the love of your life. You could have, someone could have got you saying, oh, try this drug. And before you know it, you're hooked. Look at ice. Look at heroin. Nicest people turn, turn to the street because they, they lose everything because they're seduced by this, this drug because they haven't found peace within themselves is ultimately what causes the drug addictions. All addictions come from seeking outside oneself, turns into a repetitive pattern because you're wanting to feel good. The work I'm about is actually peace work, which is the real feel-good stuff. This is innate. You don't need drugs. But you have to face all your conflict, you see. This is the really big message People who don't feel empathy tend to avoid everything. They avoid conflict. They avoid dealing with their problem. Their partner might give them a hard time and they go, oh, she's giving me a hard time, I'll leave her, rather than maybe there's something I need to look at here. And it's not about saying that person's any less, not at all. They might have come from difficult family life. You know, they may not see something about themselves that others are seeing and that helpful other could provide them a gateway or a pathway to discover more about themselves. So what people do is they shut down their feeling centre and they go into the mind or they go into games and they play and they pretend the world, because the world's all too, it's too hard to handle because they haven't been taught. And so they escape. People escape in lots of ways. Shuts down the feeling centre, which means you can't feel others, you're not feeling the empathy. We have more conflict as a result of that because people are not feeling that someone's actually having a problem here. And if they were caring, it would move them towards that person. But if you shut it down and go, I'm just going to ignore that, or you're looking at it as almost like an object, you're seeing it as an object, you cannot feel the pain of that other. When you see them as an object, you're just going to look at them and it'll be a, there'll be a sort of an idle curiosity around it, but there's no real feeling. And that's what happens when we get shut down. Technology does it to us as well. It's a low frequency. It shuts us down. All the conflict in the world is coming from lack of empathy. In the militaries, we teach the soldiers, shut it down. Obey orders. Don't think. Don't feel. Don't individuate. Do as you're told because we need you as one big fighting force in order to go out there. The thing is they're killing innocent civilians. This is not empathy. How do you feel when your target becomes a grandmother, or your target's a mother and child, or you thought someone had a gun and it was a camera. How does it feel when you actually sit 
This is what the PTSD is about, post-traumatic stress disorder, post-traumatic. They've denied it. It's post. The trauma hits when they come home because they're human. So those who were training the soldiers into this model, what you're not understanding is you're teaching them to suppress it, but it actually doesn't disappear from them. It traps, the trauma traps within the soldier because it's not his nature to kill. And that movie, as I've said before in previous um, blogs, Men That Stare at Goats, you know, when the guy was dropped into Vietnam and his and new recruits were there and there was a Viet Cong and he was running and they all shot over the Viet Cong's head and he's going, what the? <laughs> shoot, shoot, shoot. They all shot over his head because it was natural. When he did research on it, he realised that most of them will miss deliberately because it's not in our nature to hurt each other. But you have to train people to not feel. And this, and, and this is a rampage we're seeing around the world right now, going into civilian areas and calling them the enemy. They're not. If you have a problem with the government, if, we're, if our problem is oil, we already have free energy. The Tesla energy was invented. Free ionising radiation. As anyone can find out, JP Morgan at the time, the industrialist, shut it down because you couldn't meter it. So all these wars are going on, shutting down the emotional centre, having these wars in order to access oil, which is um, polluting the atmosphere, it's heating the atmosphere. This is not intelligent. This is self-defeating to go ahead and to allow people to come into governance who have vested interests. That's not democracy. That's industrial power in, and using the military for an industrial end, which isn't even a solution to the problem. The real problem is people need energy. However, the energy is being used as power in the sense of influence. If we were seriously going to tackle the energy issue on the planet, we would be bringing in the, the free energy which is available. We would have every house with solar panels at the very least. We would be creating more self-sufficiency, so we're in harmony with the planet. But because of the profit motive, which is the shutdown again of the emotional centre, the shutdown of empathy, um, this is what creates these hierarchies where there's, a, you know, again, um, the ego is in control. We shut down the feeling centre, we can't feel other people, we justify our actions and on it goes. That's what is if you like um, a more negative end to the shutting down of empathy, the bullying scenario arises because we have to put power over others in order to control. Rather than sitting back and becoming more feeling oriented, you don't actually need to control when you're actually in your feeling centre. I know that with myself. Um, I don't have any desire to control anyone. And if anything, I want them to do what makes them happy. I actually want them to have what they want. And that includes everybody. I wouldn't want them to do anything for me. That's why I didn't go into management. I didn't want to control people. I want people to find their own way. I want people to feel the freedom, which is what they say they fight for. <laughs> you can't fight for freedom. You can only give it. You can't fight for democracy. You can only create dialogue and communication in some form of agora so that we can hear all the competing views. So rather than it going to war, you'd come into a forum. That's how democracy was started. It was to stop the wars. But now we've got wars in the name of democracy, <laughs> which is funny. Anyway, it's funny. On You know what I mean. I don't actually find it that amusing, but I just see the irony of it all. It's like we don't stop and go, you know what, this is a juggernaut. It's not working. It's not going to work. It's not working for those in power either. At what point does it stop? How do we redirect the energy? I'll give you one clue. What happened in Thailand? There may well be some PR behind some of that, but let's just say there's not. <laughs> and wasn't it wonderful to see Australian, Thai and American uh, Marines coming in to help the children caught in the cave? I didn't spend a lot of time looking at that, but I did hear it. 
and I did watch a bit of it. And what I loved was seeing military used in this way, to actually serve the very people who pay for them, not others who don't, who don't care. <laughs> And that's, what, and that's what I think truly the men are looking for is to feel like men, to feel that they're protecting, to feel they're doing some good. I really feel that they're doing it for that reason. But they have to question more deeply um, and they do need to question if they're being used in the service of something else. Because when you take a life, you have to carry that with you for the rest of your life. No one can feel good about that, no matter how you argue it. But when you save a life, and that's where the heroism came out of war, was the men who saved men. They weren't depicting images of men shooting men as heroism. They ignored that bit. They saw them saving their friends because they loved their friends. Just as a family under siege would be trying to save its family members from bombs coming down because they love their family or they love their people. Love is the real heroism here. And that moves us to protect and save one another. The only circumstance, um, any sort of, I, I'm even hesitant to say this because I would never hurt anyone, but I would only say it would, well, you would have to be saving a lot of people in order to justify something of that nature. But for me personally, in the state I'm in, the mindset I'm in, my hope would be that it would never come to that decision. I would never want to harm, not anyone. I celebrate the life of all humans. But at the same time, I'm not going to judge those who are in that position and hence my empathy makes me stand in their shoes. How would I feel if I was them? And if I was in their mindset, I'd believe that I'm doing a good thing. So with that, I'll stop this video at this point and I'll read the other poem in the next video. Empathy is to feel yourself. See, I can feel the tears. That's the empathy. It doesn't mean I suffer your pain. It means that I can put myself in your shoes and really feel you. How might you be feeling? If you're sitting lonely on your own, would I not move towards you? If I feel that could be me. What it really means is you are me and I'll help you. And that's how you build community. That's how you build world peace. I look at the Syrian people, I don't see Muslims, I don't see Christians. I see human beings who are suffering, who are terrified, terrorized. All warfare is terror, is terrorism, all of it. There's not one exception. I don't care how it's marketed. People are in terror underneath it. People are suiciding underneath all this tyranny. Imagine how they feel. Imagine it's your father. Imagine it's your mother that's in harm's way. Imagine that you can't take them to a hospital. They've got an arm blown off. How would you feel? Imagine you can't get water. Imagine there's no more food. Imagine there's people scouring the streets who are desperate. Imagine people being raped and you're hearing them scream, how would you feel? Terrified. Empathy makes you feel, feel that and then you go, I would like this to stop. So rather than hearing rhetoric of, oh, this person's dissenting, no, they're feeling for the other person who they are feeling could be them. And how would they feel? Terrorised. They want the terror to stop because they know they're traumatised. Post-traumatic stress happens for them as well. Some of them never get over it. Their whole families are gone. The very support, the very people that were there who love them, gone. So I want you to sit in some empathy for those suffering in the world. Through no fault of their own, just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Who are seen as objects, not humans. Who are you? I'm sending the people great love. I'm 
I'm sending protection. I'm sending peace for them. The mother who's lost a child. Child's died in her arms. This is not pulling at heartstrings. This is what's happening. I'm crying for the soldiers who come back and they realise and they're haunted by the child they killed or the woman they killed or the people they killed. These young men, I met them, I've met them, and I saw their pain. They're in a lot of pain. And then they feel they failed because they didn't win the war. And they feel alienated from their society because they've been taught to kill and they're not allowed to kill when they come back because it's against the law. Yet they've been trained, they're automatic. They carry the guilt and the shame of it. Some of them go into denial because they just can't bear to go there and they don't talk about it. I know, I know from... Second World War from Vietnam, I know that they came back and they didn't want to talk about it. What you're seeing through me is empathy. This is empathy. I really care about them. I care about the people, all of them, because it's an absolute tragedy that people have to go to war. It's an absolute tragedy, but I understand that we're still learning as a civilization. We're a very young civilization. We do not understand the power of love yet. We think it's some whimsical thing, idealistic. It's not. It's the very foundation of our humanity. It is what stops us from harming another. It stops us from bullying another. It, it's the very instinct within us that will save someone if we think they're um, in trouble. We are very beautiful, actual fact. When people allow that part of themselves to express, there is nothing more exciting and more beautiful than someone who saves another's life. And that could be even sitting, this is not just the physical heroism of men, it's also the women who sit and um, really talk through with the one suffering. I've seen many women sit down for hours and hours with someone suffering to help them get through their trauma. That's a loving kindness. They give their time because they care. And it's been denigrated as a weakness and it's not. It's who we are. So with that, I send you all love and peace and empathy. Do not harm each other. Deal with your problems. Do not support violence as it serves no good thing other than the lessons that come from it, which is to stop it to start to take responsibility, to find another way. It is not the type of activity that one wants to profit from. There is no profit in this. Take care. Love you. Bye.